you have your Bibles, um, grab it and go with me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 16. And as we shared with you when we were making preparations for this week, we have a uh, Bible study or lesson plan that's available for you. You can download it on our website, and if you want to go through that with us, you can grab that or it's something for you to study throughout the week. Um, since we're not going to be having midweek services, we're wanting to make available to anyone out there an opportunity to join one of our small groups that's going to be led by our elders, it's going to be done uh, through Zoom, so make sure you can connect with that and um, just be a part of that. Good way to just grow deeper in the Word of God to allow God to be who He would have us to be. So if you have your Bibles, um, go with me. To, uh, I'm beginning a new series today that we'll be talking about this whole concept of an Elijah generation. So we want to um, just allow God just to move and God to speak. So if you have your Bibles, um, just go to 1 Kings chapter 16. And I want to jump down right in the middle of that and look at verse 30. Verse 30, let me read one verse. Then we're going to pray and then we're going to talk through this to allow God to move and have his way. Verse 30 says it this way, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Let me read that one more time. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Let's look to God for a word of prayer, and then we're just going to talk through this message and allow God just to move and have his way in our midst. Father, we thank you for you, God. A lot of us are shut in. A lot of us are, God, aren't able to get out. But thank you for the advancement of technology, God, that it makes sense when we process what you're saying, that heaven and earth may pass away, but your word would not pass away, God. And even when you said to Peter in the New Testament, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is proof that God, the church, still advances on because it's not so much a building, but it's in the lives of the people, God. So as we go to your word this morning, I'm praying that you would just open our hearts to hear. That give us something, God, that was said that would touch someone to encourage someone to just go on and be who you would have us to be. So we bless you. We thank you for what you're doing. You're an awesome and wonderful God, Lord. Speak through me to your people. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. For some time, we've been in a series of prayer, and, and, and we're not deviating from that. I'm just going to, this series that the Lord has just placed on my heart as we lead up to um, the Christmas season, the season that's ahead of us, that I think that in this season, I mean, Easter, I kept saying, man, I'm ready to go for Christmas, did not I? Easter, thank you, this Easter season that's ahead of us, kind of tell you where my head is, um, that God is calling for a different group of people. He's calling for, I want to use the phrase, an Elijah generation. And as we talk about what that means to be part of this Elijah generation, we'll be going through this narrative studying the life of Elijah in the book of First Kings. So I want to invite you to join with us over the upcoming weeks until we get to Easter. We'll take a break for Easter and resume this uh, so that God would just speak to us and have his way. But what I'm learning more and more is that God is calling for his church to be different. I mean, he's calling that as people of God, we should be different in this world in which we find ourselves. Here's what people forget about the church of God, is that we are a called out people. We are the ecclesia. We are a chosen nation, a people that's called by God to declare the wonders of God in this world. So here's what that means. We ought to be transformers, not conformers. The Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable. It says this is your reasonable act of worship. And here's verse 2. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that we may prove what God's will is. And the challenge that, as we look at the text that's in front of us today, 
is that this king that we're going to look at is a king that chose to conform to the patterns of his environment rather than being a transformer. He chose to give in to the people that God had called him to lead. He, he chose to become part of the cultural norm as opposed to standing and making a difference and being who God would call and God would want him to be. Now, if you know anything about Old Testament his history, Here's what the Old Testament looks like as it relates to God and his relationship with people. God wanted to be their king. He wanted to be their main person. He wanted to be their leader. But here's the Israelites, right? Just like us today, we look around the world and we look around at what's happening in society. And the Israelites, as opposed to being focused on God, they too wanted to look like the world. Why? Because the people in the world or the other nations in the world, they had human kings. They had a king that they could see. They had a king that they could touch. They had a king that they could feel. So what did they do? They wanted to have a king to look just like the world where God now wanted to be there their only king and his intent was this. He would have a relationship with them such he would love them so much that the world would see this relationship they had with God and they would be jealous and they would want to come into a relationship with God. So what does the Israelites do? They go to Samuel at the time who was the prophet and this is in 1 Samuel, I mean 1 Samuel chapter 8 and they say to Samuel, Samuel we want a king. And Samuel is trying to convince them, hey, you have the king of kings. You have the Lord of lords. You have the king that, that, that's, that, 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 that transcends all kings. But they're saying to him, we want to look like the rest of the world. And isn't that true with the church today when you think about it? As opposed to us trusting God faithfully, we too want to look like the rest of the world. But there's a problem with that. So here's what God said to Samuel. Samuel The people are not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And if they're asking for a king, he said, give them what they want, but caution them that when they get a king, there are several things that the king is going to do to them. And you're going to find this once again in 1 Samuel chapter 8. They're going to take their sons, they're going to take their daughters, they're going to take their land, they're going to take their animals and use it for their own personal gain. And they're not going to treat the people of God the way the people of God are to be treated. So God allowed Samuel to give the people what their request is. Now, if you were to fast forward ahead, forward ahead, now we are in the book of 1 Kings, which is our text for today. And when you get to the book of 1 Kings, here's what we see right in that book. We see now that verse 15, I mean chapter 15 and chapter 16, it chronicles for us the kings that became or were leaders over the, uh, the kingdom or the people of God, specifically in the northern part of the kingdom after the people found themselves in ex- exile. So chapter 15 enumerates a list of those kings. Then we get to chapter 16, and the list continues with a list of those kings that were ruling over uh, Israel at the time. But then when you get down to chapter verse 29 of chapter 16, we run into this interesting king that we're going to talk about this morning that sets the scene for this series that we're going to go into. Now, if you notice and you were to read chapter 15 and 16, here's what you would notice. That the prophecy of Samuel came true in that each one of those kings were progressively deviant and progressively divisive and progressively taking and doing exactly what the prophet said they were going to do. And from the first king up until Omri, who we find now is the father of Ahab, the guy we're going to look at, things got progressively worse to the point where God decided it was time to intervene. And so now, verse 29 picks up of chapter 16, and here's what it says. In the third year of the reign of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria. Notice this. For 22 years. And look at what verse 30 says. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord 
more than all who were before him. Now, I just want to share two simple truths with you because as we're going and we're online, we don't want to keep you long. We want to be sensitive to time. So the first thing I want you to lock up is I want you to understand who this Ahab is, right? And I refer to him as Israel's most wicked king at that particular point in time. So you might be asking, who is this Ahab and what has he done and what is it about him? Because the text pointedly says to us, he was the most wicked king that had ever um, been uh, up until this time. Look at verse 31. And if it had been as if it has been a, a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, right? And look at the text. He took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal and he built it, that he built in Samaria. Verse 33 says, And Ahab made an Asherah, Ahab did more. I mean, this is repeated twice, which tells you how bad this fellow was. He did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. Look at verse 34, then we're going to talk about this. In his days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of Abraham, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sechub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, here's what you need to know about this fellow by the name of Ahab, right? He did three things that really caught the attention of God. And the fourth we're going to look at is the influence that he had on the people that he was leading. Notice what the text opened up by saying. Number one, he married Jezebel. Now, I'm going to challenge you all to hang around with us because when we get to Jezebel, I'm, I'm going to talk about Jezebel because there's a spirit there that we've got to really understand. He married Jezebel, and, and the scripture is clear where it says, was the daughter of Eth Baal. Now, if you know anything about Israel history, here's what the scripture says. When they inhabited Canaan, they were not supposed to intermarry. They were supposed to maintain the purity of the land and the purity of the people that God had called them to be. This fella was so defiant that he went and got him a Phoenician wife. Now, here's what's interesting about Jezebel, is that she was the daughter of Eve Baal, right? And, and, and it's almost like this guy was the father of all the gods and the father of pagan worship. And he goes out and he marries this woman, <laughs> You got to get this, right? That, that now becomes responsible for having the prophets of God find themselves in hiding, having the people of God finding themselves running, having the people of God not being where God would have them to be. Listen, y'all, I'm trying to say this fellow thought he was all that and that he didn't need God. He would go off and do these divine things. Number one, he married Jezebel. Then we're going to talk about it. And look at the second thing that he did, right, is that here's how I summarize this in verse 31. He was duly aligned in his theocracy. Let me, let me tell you what that means. Look at, look, at verse, look at verse 31. Let's read this, and then we're going to talk about this. Verse 31 says, And if, as if he had to keep it light, there was no light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam his father, he took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel of Sidian, and he went and served the Baals and worshipped him. Here is what I mean when I say the phrase, he was duly aligned in his theocracy. Remember with me, Ahab was king over Israel. Now, if you know anything about the Israelites, the Israelites were the children of God. So here's what that means. Part of him worshipped Yahweh. You, you get it? So, in other words, he worshipped God when it was convenient, but because he had to go home to Jezebel. Oh, y'all going to get this in a little while. He had to worship Baal. So it's almost as if he had a split personality where he had convinced himself into thinking, I can serve God and I can serve Baal. 
And here's the striking thing about Baal worship, right? The argument with the Phoenician world and the pagan world at the point in time, where the Israelites worshiped God as the one true God, the people who worshiped Baal had fooled themselves into thinking that God, Jehovah Elohim, Yahweh, was no different than Baal. And so they were trying to put Baal side by side with God because they wanted the Israelites to see that their God, those who worship Baal, was no different than their God they worship. Oh, you, you want to get you want to get to the battle on Mount Carmel. Y'all gonna see where this is going in a little while. And, and so here's what ba- I mean, Ahab did because of his marriage. Let me put a parenthetic. Be careful who you marry, y'all. <laughs> be careful, be careful, because they might they might might allow you to do God from home. Be careful, <laughs> be careful, be careful. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Come on, y'all, come on, come on. Listen, tap the person that's watching this with you and say, be careful who you marry. Amen. (laughs) Be careful who you marry, all right? So he was duly alive, and here's how this manifested itself, right? Look at the third thing. He was also, because he was duly alive in this theocracy, that forced him now to be duly aligned in his worship. So here's what that means. You'll notice, we're going to see this in a little while, he had Obadiah and he had the prophets of God in his corner. But you're going to see in a little while, here's what the text says. He had built an altar to Baal. Not, let me back up. He built a temple for Baal in Samaria. And then in that temple, he built an altar for Baal. So here's what it looked like for this fellow. You're going to see this in a little while. He would go here and he would go to the temple in Jerusalem with the Israelites and he would worship God. But then he would spend time in the temple of Baal that he built to worship Baal. Can we say confuse? You see now why the text says he did more to provoke God to anger more than any of the other kings. Why are you saying that? When I read Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, here's what it says. I the Lord your God, and what kind of a God? A jealous God. You shall have no other God before me. You shall not make any image. You shall not bow down to them, nor shall you worship them. Come on, are you with me? Uh, Because here's the thing, and, and here's the mistake this guy was making. He was God's king over God's people, but at the same time, crazy enough to construct a temple. And I'm going to keep saying this, because of who he was married to. <laughs> a temple and leave the place of worship for God and go in this place and worship Baal. Don't you think if you find yourself putting idols before God that that will get God's attention? You wonder now, you wonder now why the text is going where it's going. And we're going to see this in a little while. And then look at the, 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 the fourth thing he did. Because he was a leader... He was influential in his leadership. And, and, and let, me, let me just put a word of caution to those of us that are in leadership. We need to be careful how we lead God's people. Because they're watching us and they're looking to see what we're doing. Even in this season where we're dealing with all this coronavirus and all the stuff that's going on. If leaders, we don't obey the law, the law of the land, here's what it's going to communicate to our people. That they too can be defiant to the laws of the land, right? We need to obey what God has done. But because this fellow was a leader... Here's what's happening now. Look at the text. Look at the text. Let me read it. Then I'm going to explain it. It says, verse 34, in his days, Hill of Bethel built Jericho, and he had laid the foundation at the cost of Abraham, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke, which was spoke by Joshua, son of Nun, right? Um, You got to lock into this. So, So here's what this is saying. You will remember that when God allowed the Israelites to go into Jericho, you remember this, they marched around the walls of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And here's the prophecy that Joshua issued. Joshua said, no one dare not rebuild this city or rebuild the, the walls of this city or else it will cost them their firstborn. Now, look at, look at Ahab's defiance and look at the influence now he has over the people he's leading. People had become so defiant that they disregarded regarded the word of Joshua over that city, and this fella, at the risk of losing his own children, goes and he rebuilds this city. Man, tell me, 
Tell me that will not provoke God to anger. Tell me that won't do something to, to influence and to just to get God upset. Come on, come on, tell me that that won't do that. We, we serve a God who we need to be careful, who we mess with, and what God is saying. So the question is this. All right, preacher, what, what, what does that have to do with this concept of Elijah generation? And what does that have to do with, with Ahab, and what does that have to do with me, and what does all of that have to do with where we find ourselves today? So here's what I want to share with you, and this is the message I want you all to get. Remember with me that Ahab was accused of three unthinkable sins. Don't forget that, right? Number one, he was married to Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. Here's what Ahab looks like today. Ahab, in my opinion, represents a system of government or leadership or any person that is married to wickedness. I want you all to hear me. In other words, it is a system that is committed to moral degradation or people or persons that are committed to moral degradation such that they will settle for anything because, because they stand for nothing. Right, And when we find people like that, that will not stand for truth or have a moral value or standing on which they will stand on to say, thus said the Lord, we can identify such individuals as having the spirit of Ahab or being Ahab. Here, here's, what, here, here's what I said to you. He, had, he was dual in his theocracy, right? Duly aligned in his theocracy. Here, here's Ahab. He wanted to have his cake and he wanted to eat it too. Preacher, what do you mean? Here's what that looks like. In other words, he wanted to serve God, and he wanted to serve the world at the same time. I, I hope this is making sense, right? Because you and I, we know people like that. We know people that want to serve God, but when it's convenient to them because of who they're married to, and I'm not talking about anybody's spouses, or I want you to hear me, but because of who, let me add this phrase, or what they're married to, we have fooled ourselves into thinking that we can serve God and we can serve the world at the same time. Matter of fact, here's how Scripture says it, right? No one can serve what? Two masters, either you're going to love one or hate the other, or you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. And if you know anything about the God that I serve, the God that I serve is not going to share his love with anyone. Come on. The God that I serve is not going to share his, his grace with anyone. He wants us to be committed to him. Choose one or choose the other. Here's the other part about Ahab. He was also doing literally a line in his worship life. And, and I'm not picking on nobody. I'm just saying thus say the Lord and show you how this can connect his life. Here's what that looks like. On Sunday, we want to come and worship God. But because we built temples for Baal. Oh, Lord. <laughs> come on now. On Mondays now, when we leave, we... <laughs> Come on, we want to leave and we want to worship Baal, but when Sunday come, because we know of what God has done, we want to come back and worship God, but then on Monday, we want to go worship Baal. And, and when you look at Ahab, I don't know about you, I want you to hear me say that Ahab could be me and Ahab could be you if we're not careful of where our allegiances are. I want you to hear me say that. We must be, especially in this season where we find ourselves in this crisis, we must be cognizant of who we are aligned to. You cannot be dually aligned. Either it's the God or it is, it's the world, but we must choose whom we're going to serve. I want you to hear me say, we must choose who we are going to serve. You cannot be doing it line. You cannot be all that stuff. We must be sold out to God to allow God to move and have his way. But I love the text. I love the text because after we see how bad Ahab is, after we see how challenging this fellow was, and after we see what a challenge he was, God decided to take action. And God decided to do something. Remember with me, Samuel issued the prophecy from God that if you want a worldly king, here is what the worldly king is going to do. They're going to take your children, your sons, and your daughters. They're going to take your land. They're going to take your property. They're going to abuse you. They're going to do all these things. Does anybody in here know that God will only allow things to go wrong for so long before he intervenes? So Elijah comes on the scene. 
And Elijah's name means Yahweh is my God or Yahweh is hell, El or Jehovah is my God. And, and I love this because as bad as things seemed for the Israelites in the day of Ahab, God did not forget them. God raised up an Elijah just for this occasion. And I'm getting excited because I can't help myself because I want you all to know today that as bad as it looks, God has an Elijah generation that he's raising up. Come on, to preserve the land. It doesn't matter what Ahab has done. And y'all excuse me if I get ahead of myself. It doesn't matter how bad Ahab has been. God has raised up an Elijah generation. So notice what chapter Chapter 17, the first few verses says, Now Elijah the Tibbite of Tishbe of Gilead went to, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall neither be dew nor rain on, for these next years except at my word. Come on, I need you to talk to your neighbor and just say, whoever you're sitting with or watching with, if it's yourself, say this to yourself. God is raising up an Elijah generation. Now, 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 now let me say this, and, and, and I made some notes. So here's what an Elijah generation. Elijah generation represents a generation of people who are unafraid to say that the God I serve is the only true and living God. This is a generation of people who are unafraid to say to Ahab, meet me on Mount Carmel, the place where we worship God. This is a generation of people who will say we, that they're living in a time when God is raising them up to go to the individual to, with the word of the Lord to call society to repentance and to a relationship with God. This Elijah generation is unafraid to stand before kings and governors. These will be individuals who are equipped with faith and without fear and will stand among anyone and declare the truth that God is calling his people to return to him. And I just wonder if this morning God is not using the church as an Elijah generation in the storm to go to the Ahabs and to say, it's time to get back to get to God. This Elijah Elijah generation is going to say it's time for us to stop doing things the way we've been doing it traditionally and not know why we've been doing things, but to return to the truth of God's word. He is raising up an Elijah generation of people who are going to worship him in spirit and in truth, a people that will not be dual, duly aligned to the world and to the church, to the church and to the world. These are people that will be in church worshiping God, but then they'll know how to take the church back to the world because they'll realize in this season the church is not a building, it's a people. Come on, I want you to hear me. And whether you go to a building to a worship or your home to worship, this Elijah generation will realize it doesn't matter where you are, God is always there. He's raising up an Elijah generation that will be willing to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and to help those that are sick and heal, come on, those that are going through difficult times. This Elijah generation generation will flow in the spirit and the anointing of the Lord because regardless of where they find themselves, they will say the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news of the gospel. God is raising up an Elijah generation. And my, my cry and my appeal to you this morning is if you name the name of the Lord, you ought to be part of that Elijah generation. You ought to be part of what God is calling you to do. Come on, I want you to hear me. You ought to be a part of what God is saying. So here is what I'm hoping you hear me say this morning, right? So if you're part of an Elijah generation, you choose God, not the gods of this world. You get it? So, so, so here's what that means. Here's what this means. Elijah's generation has to be prepared to divorce Jezebel <laughs> and be, be committed to God. So my prayer this morning, my cry out to you, and we're going to be talking about this in the upcoming weeks. If you're not part of that Elijah generation, here's all you got to do, right? Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That's simple. And salvation is yours. And God gives you the strength. God gives you the ability. God gives you the wherewithal to stand and be all that he has called you to be. 
Here's what I want to say. Wherever you find yourself watching uh, worshiping with us this morning, be it in Colorado, be it anywhere, any state in the United States, be it any place all over the world, salvation is really simple. All you need to do is say, God, I've blown it. God, I've sinned, and I want to be a part of that generation because I find myself in crisis, and I know you're speaking. I know you're saying something, and you're doing something. So, God, I need you to come into me. So if that's you, I just want you to bow your heads with me this morning. I want to say a word of prayer. And, and, uh, and salvation is so simple. All you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Christ from the dead and you can be saved. So, Father, we thank you for you, God. That as your word has gone forth, God, that you speak to those that are watching across the airwaves. And should there be one that's saying, man, I want to be a part of that Elijah generation. I want to know God like that. God, draw them. God, bring them in. God, enable, come into my life and save me. Forgive me for my sins. Make me whole again. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're doing. You're an awesome, you're a wonderful God. So God, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for Elijah, God, that you raise up when there's an Ahab presence. And I thank you for the people of God across this globe, across this universe. You have a remnant, God, a people that you've preserved that when Ahab is raising his head, they can say, thus said the Lord. So Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit, save. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen.